Thanks so much for coming. I'm Celia Wexler. I'm a member of the Press Club's Professional Development Committee, and I've written two books. The first, Out of the News, Former Journalists Discuss a Profession in Crisis, won a national award from the Society of Professional Journalists. But it was the second book uh, to be published this fall, Catholic Women Confront Their Church, Stories of Anger and Hope, which introduced me to the challenges of interviewing sexual assault survivors and writing their stories. So I was very receptive when Julie Hsu, the head of our journalism institute, and Julie, you should stand up so people can see you, <laughs> suggested this panel and helped plan it. We knew this topic would be newsworthy, but we could not have predicted how newsworthy. Whether it was Rolling Stone's story of a gang rape that failed to withstand scrutiny, the role of a stand-up comic in calling out decades-old accusations against Bill Cosby, the revelation that a former Speaker of the House had been paying hush money to someone he had reportedly abused as a high school coach, or the new feature film Spotlight, reminding us of the Catholic Church's efforts to cover up priestly pedophilia. Sexually, sexual assault has definitely been in the news. Indeed, 2015 ended with Cosby being criminally charged for a sexual assault he committed allegedly in 2000, he allegedly committed in 2004. And as we know, 2016 began with allegations of abuse at an elite prep school in Rhode Island that occurred in the 1970s and 80s. And even next week, on January 14th, the American Association of University Women will hold an event here at the Press Club to discuss their new analysis of reported rapes on college campuses. But writing about sexual assault allegations and interviewing survivors can present many unique challenges. And we, today, hope to give you some guidance about reporting on rape and sexual assault, and we have a terrific panel. And I'll, I will go right to left, hopefully, well, my right anyway. Um, Kristen Lombardi has been an award-winning journalist for more than two decades, for nearly two decades, I should say. I don't want to make her older than she is. She has worked for the Center for Public Integrity since 2007. Her investigation into campus assaults earned her the Robert F. Kennedy Award, the Dart Award, and the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Public Service. As a young staff writer for the Boston Phoenix, her reporting helped expose the clergy sexual abuse scandal in that city, and her investigative reporting has earned her many journalism awards, including a Neiman Fellowship in Journalism from Harvard in 2011. Uh, Bruce Shapiro is executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, which encourages innovative reporting on violence, conflict, and tragedy worldwide. An award-winning reporter on human rights, criminal justice, and politics, he is a contributing editor at The Nation. His books include Shaking the Foundations, 200 Years of Investigative Journalism in America, and Legal Lynching, The Death Penalty and America's Future. His work at DART also earned him an award from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies for his contributions to the social understanding of trauma. In 2011, Liz Sakuro's memoir, Crash Into Me, A Survivor's Search for Justice, was published. She's an advocate for sexual assault survivors and a public speaker, and is a regular contributor to all the major broadcast networks. She writes for the Daily Beast, Glamour, and Time. She teaches Georgetown University journalism students about interviewing the survivors of violence. And she started her own foundation, STARS, Sisters Together Assisting Rape Survivors, Supporting Nonprofits That Help Victims of Sexual Assault, Incest, and Domestic Violence. Her work has been honored by Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and the Victims' Rights Law Center. And our last panelist is Jennifer Marsh, who's the vi vi Vice President of Victim Services at RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, the country's largest anti-sexual violence organization. Marsh has worked as a subject matter expert in the area of sexual violence for more than 10 years. She currently oversees the National Sexual Assault Hotlines as well as Sexual Assault Helplines for the Department of Defense, Defense and the Peace Corps. 
And we will make sure with this wonderful panel that you have enough time for your questions. Thank you all for being here today. And I'd like to start by just asking each of you to describe your respective organizations and to tell us how you each got involved with the issue of sexual assault. And we will just start with Kristen and move down, I think. OK. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, as Celia mentioned, I'm now at the Center for Public Integrity. That's a nonprofit journalism organization. Our mission is investigative reporting in the public interest. Um, I have been uh, reporting on um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, and rape uh, throughout the course of, of my career. Um, I pretty much uh, learned uh, how to do so on my own through investigative stories, exposing systemic failures or wrongdoing involving sexual abuse, rape, or child molestation victims. Um, and my first real experience with this was in 2001 as a, a pretty young reporter um, uh, doing an investigative piece on Boston Archdiocese's cover-up of four decades of uh, child molestation by a pretty notorious pedophile priest, John Gagan. Um, I did um, reporting in that series looking at the archdiocese's, uh, uh, you know, cover-up, really, of, of sexual abuse. It uh, laid the groundwork for massive scrutiny of the archdiocese and um, in that city. And uh, really, um, I think, kind of identified me as a reporter that was willing to look at this topic. Um, because once I did those uh, stories, I would get calls from people asking me to look at institutional response to sexual assault in other uh, arenas. So I looked at the Hasidic Jewish community. I looked at family courts. And then at the center, I did a big series looking at how colleges and universities respond to and adjudicate campus rape cases. So that has been my, um, I guess, experience in this topic? Um, much of what I know about how to report best on, on sexual assault issues I learned from Kristen Lombardi. So whatever she says is true. Um, <laughs> if any of you have seen Spotlight, there's a moment where one of the characters says, well, but, but, but the Phoenix already had this story. Her. Uh, <laughs> um, I... Uh, you know, like a lot of reporters, some of my earliest reporting was on on criminal justice, and it stayed with me as a theme uh, as my career, beginning in the early 80s, moved on. And in the mid-90s, I was doing a lot of writing for The Nation magazine on uh, the criminal justice system and on the experiences of survivors of violence and, and whether what was then a very kind of vengeance and punishment driven uh, political agenda was really meeting the needs of uh, survivor populations. And, and in part because of that, um, I began spending a lot of time talking to um, sexual violence survivors and advocates and networks and came to the conclusion that what we as journalists um, at that point knew or thought we knew in the approaches that we often would take to both individual survivors and to these stories um, was at best ignorant and at worst harmful. Um, so in the, in the mid-90s, it wasn't only me working on this. There were a few other journalists and clinicians and advocates and educators all finding ourselves working on this. And we came together through support from something called the DART Foundation in 1999, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which today is located at Columbia University. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, sexual violence has been at the heart of what we do, um, trying to, first of all, learn from uh, scientific evidence, clinical evidence, trying to learn from survivors themselves, but also trying to learn from journalists who have got it right what best practices are and to start both an interdisciplinary conversation that includes folks like these here at the table, and also within the craft, within the tribe, a journalist-to-journalist -journalist conversation about how to improve 
reporting on um, survivors of violence of all kinds, but with a, often a very particular focus on uh, violence against women and, and sexual violence, a particular and pervasive problem in our culture. Um, I'll leave it there, and I'm sure we'll come back to specifics as the conversation goes on. Don't leave it there, Bruce. Keep going. Um, I have come to this space in so many ways, and, and, and while I am a journalist and I do write about gender-based violence as well as lighter topics, I think I'm coming to you all today with more of a victim-based perspective for the purposes of why we're here. Um, I was sort of thrust into this spotlight, no pun intended, <laughs> Phoenix, um, uh, through my own case, which was a gang rape in 1984 at the University of Virginia. I know that sounds a little familiar to many of you and is very timely. Um, and as my case was being adjudicated, but much more before that, I decided to go public because I thought, oh, what the heck? What's the harm in this? Why wouldn't anybody embrace the experiences of somebody who's been through something so horrible? And I could not have been more wrong. And... Um, it was so interesting because I was not dealing with the two of you. Um, you know, I, and what we'll talk about a little bit today is some of the most egregious um, examples of lack of best practices that journalists have done in approaching me. And it was, I'm proud to have been a guinea pig and sort of one of the first people to come forward with, I think, the exception of Tricia Miley, the Central Park victim, whose, whose focus was mostly on traumatic brain injury. Um, but also some of the most wonderful experiences and the way journalists have boosted this. And here we are today, as Celia mentioned, just at the center of this storm and how are we going to be better. So I decided, um, after my own case was over, to sort of continue to, to leave my then career as a party planner. Gee, could that be more different? Um, hey. And... Um, you know, to, to be a full-time advocate and to write and to speak. And now, rather than just focusing on universities and colleges, which, of course, a systemic failure, I have moved on to a place of speaking with sports teams, both professional and on campuses, speaking with corporations, because I think corporations, although we might want to paint them as sometimes dark and bad, at least there is accountability there. Um, and... Um, and, and, and serving on boards. I, you know, I'm really proud to be on the board of Serve Justice. We have some lovely people here today who help to adjudicate for those who don't have a voice in secondary school and in collegiate um, places where we talk about sexual assault, most recently the Labrie case at St. Paul's, um, as well as I am on the board of one in four. So I, I've sort of taken this all and with age and wisdom, tried to make this much more of a positive thing rather than a woe is me telling my story. And, and I know while that's, while that's interesting, I think it's become such a greater topic and in dealing with, and Kristen was one of the, f the first people to ever interview me, and that was the most lovely experience. And I've worked also with Rain being on there, Kate Hall and Jen, you guys have been so terrific. So with that rambling introduction of wearing all of the hats, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I would like to say how happy I am to be here as well and um, just how wonderful it is that we're even having this conversation. I think over the past 10 years, um, through my personal experience working at Rain, we've really seen a change in the conversations that we have with the media. And I was talking to Bruce about this beforehand. Uh, we have journalists that are coming to us and where they are in terms of their questions and information around the issue of sexual violence is just light years from where it was. Uh, and this issue has received unprecedented attention, I believe, over the past five years, and it just continues, it seems, to grow, um, due in no small part, obviously, to the work from the folks up here in the room and those watching. So I think it's important to underscore that because of that work and that effort, and the stories that you all are telling, we continue to see an unprecedented level of people reaching out for help. 
Rain created and operates the National Sexual Assault Hotlines, and we, every year, continue to see our highest numbers ever. And so many of those folks, this is the first time that they are reaching out for help. And so many of them, around half, um, especially on our online service, are talking about an assault or abuse that took place five or more years ago. And they're saying things like, I read the story about Cosby. I read this story. I saw this news coverage. So I just can't underscore enough how important is the work that you all are doing around this topic. Um, thanks very much. I think that that starts us out very well with a, a conversation. I just wanted to ask Kristen and, and Bruce, as journalists, what are your responsibilities um, to those who are sexually assaulted and to those accused of assault? Because, you know, you have that double thing to have to think about. I mean, I think your responsibilities uh, are to the story, just like any other story. The only difference is the kind of care, I think, that you need to take when uh, doing the actual reporting. Um, and uh, I think over the years, I've, I've tried to hone my approach. Um, I have a very specific approach. Um, and it's, it's served me well for a number of reasons. Um, you know, when I first started, it was primarily on tuition, and I really didn't know much about sexual assault. I didn't know much about trauma. I didn't know um, the emotional toll it could take on the reporter. Um, I was not prepared for the kinds of um, pitfalls and, and landmines that you can find yourself in just through asking questions um, about, you know, someone's sexual assault or rape. Um, and so I've kind of developed an approach and, and learned um, some pretty important things, I think. And the first is, I mean, really, when you do these stories, you have to think about traditional models of reporting being kind of turned upside down. Um, and you have to be willing to relinquish control a little bit, um, which is anathema, I think, to a lot of um, journalists. But it's so important when you are actually um, interviewing uh, victims and survivors. And it works to your advantage w as well with the alleged perpetrator. Um, so I've learned pretty much um, that you're not going to get these kinds of interviews just through your persistence. Um, the best way to approach um, a victim I've learned is through a trusted intermediary, and so I've always developed sources around um, the the victim. And like I said, most of my stories have been investigations of institutional response, and um, that's a different kind of story than than someone's individual rape. You're trying to connect larger dots um, and and look at systemic failures, um, but. So, you know, we've always, I've always developed um, sources around, for instance, in the Campus Assault series, students who may have filed rape reports with their institutions. Uh, people like Daniel Carter, who's sitting here right now, um, victim advocates on campus and off, lawyers, student activists, um, parents. Those were always our first um, um, phone calls. Um, because I've learned in the few times that I have cold called a, a rape survivor, that's, you know, really not a very good idea. Um, but these are also people that uh, are beaten down by the system, disbelieved, um, and uh, silenced often. Um, so many people have told me that the institutional response was more traumatic than the assault itself. And so the level of distrust is very, very high. And as a reporter, it's the first thing you face. And so I felt like the trusted intermediary, it's a layer that, you know, it's another layer, right? Um, and sometimes we don't want, we, we want the fastest route. Um, but it's, it's important for that reason, just to deal with, with trust. Um, and also, transparency and informed consent is kind of like my motto, and I don't think a lot of reporters think about this in other 
in covering other topics, but I've always felt and learned that it's really best up front to explain your goals for your story or your series um, and, and prepare victims for what lies ahead. This is my reporting process. This is what it's going to take. Um, I'm going to have to talk to X, Y, Z. It could include uh, and will include your uh, alleged perpetrator. Um, and, and making sure they're fully aware of, of what it's going to take up front is very helpful. Um, you know, I always have tended to go to victims first and then go to the uh, accused students. When I go to or with, with um, you know, Gagan, it was Gagan, but um, by then I can say I've talked to you know, your victims, and uh, this is what I've heard, and I'd like to give you a chance to respond. And usually, um, that works, as opposed to going to them saying, I haven't talked to anybody. Um, I'll just add a, f a few things to what Kristen said, because I think that's a fantastic overview. I've had the sort of the luxury of uh, seeing a lot of sexual assault reporting and trying to figure out what it has in common when it goes well, and also what it has in common when it doesn't go so well. Um, first of all, just to put the question of the accused right up front, I think, I think that's a central question for us. Uh, I mean, many of us as journalists who are reporting on sexual assault stories one day are on another day reporting on people who are in prison for stuff they didn't do. And um, a similar, we have to bring a, a similar impulse for justice to both kinds of reporting and an awareness um, of fairness and an awareness of presumptions of innocence and, and other things. And to remember that most often when sexual assault stories are significant, when they involve, in fact, institutional responses, and that's often where the center of gravity really is. I think reporters sometimes get led astray into Baroque arguments about representations of the accused because they're focusing on the act, an alleged incident, rather than understanding that the center of gravity of their own investigation and their own narrative is in are the, are, are the institutions of society responding in a proper, appropriate, speedy, just, aggressive way to protect survivors and to, uh, to, to address accusations, find justice. Um, I, I think that when stories go well, Kristen used a very important idea that I want to expand on. She said it, it, a lot of normal journalism rules get turned upside down. Um, I, my understanding of what she meant by that anyway, or at least the way I think about it, is that when you're dealing with sexual assault, as with many other kinds of trauma, but most in some ways most powerfully with sexual assault. What you have to remember is of all the bad things that can happen to you in life, the single most predictive of post-traumatic stress disorder and other psychological injury. Only sexual assault and torture are at the far high end of that scale. War, disaster, uh, all, assault, all kinds of other things, routine assault, all kinds of other things can have very bad psychological outcomes, as we know. But sexual assault is powerfully predictive of long-term psychological injury. So what you're dealing with very often in victims, in survivors, are folks who, whatever their original social status, have lost enormous power. Power over life and death, power over safety, and power sometimes over their own psychological state. So a lot of our practices as reporters, a lot of our rules and a lot of our craft techniques for interviewing, for example, are really set up for people who have a lot of power. We all know how to kind of go into the Oval Office, keep President Obama on the record, ask him the stuff he doesn't want to be asked, be a general pain in the neck. Uh, same thing with corporate officials or with mayors or, or um, police captains. We know what to do. <coughs> but we need a different toolkit for people who don't have power. And in particular, 
when people have had power taken away from them by sexual assault. It means seeking extra levels of permission, things we wouldn't normally ask. Having that other person there, that trusted intermediary, working through intermediaries rather than the confrontation interview. Uh, perhaps showing people quotes, reading people quotes, showing them passages, whatever works for you. There's all kinds of things that reporters do now, pretty commonly, that reverse the power equation in ways that restore some control to uh, survivors of sexual violence. And, uh, you know, when, Liz, you talked about and encounter, encounters being good ones, at, at least from what I've seen, that's usually a crucial component. Does the survivor feel she has some power, some agency in this equation? Um, I think that's one of the things that goes well. Another thing that goes well when these stories go right is a kind of narrative ethics, is a kind of scrupulousness about knowing where the center of gravity of the story really is, not, not focusing on uh, salacious details or sensational details that aren't really where the story lives. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about, about the Rolling Stone story last year, um, and there's a lot to say about it. For me, one of the uh, roots of the problem of that story is not any of the stuff about fact-checking and stuff, which is pretty obvious. It's that the story focused the reader's attention on a very sensational event when its journalistic center of gravity actually was elsewhere. So it's a kind of bait and switch, and that's not fair to the survivor, not fair to the reader, not fair to the story itself. And it's a lot of us, uh, I think, sometimes have produced drafts that are out of sync. There's a particular high level of emotional valence in sexual assault stories that means you need to be paying attention to that kind of narrative ethics. Um, and finally, I think another thing, when things go right or when they go wrong, is in the encounter with between journalist and survivor. Um, clinicians who deal with severely emotionally damaged people sometimes talk about the need for uh, what they call SET, S-E-T, a kind of a three-level three, three um, system for encounter where you provide support, empathy, and truth. And in a journalistic context, when dealing with sexual assault, I think those, those are the three legs of, of the interviewing stool. So support, yes, I want to tell your story, I, I want to help you. Empathy is not about you as a reporter. Empathy is this must be an understand, expressed understanding. This must be very hard for you, that sort of thing. And a, a real understanding of the challenges facing the victim and survivor. And a lot of reporters have gotten pretty good at both of those things. But the hard one, in some ways, is truth. As, as Kristen said, to do this story, here is what we are going to have to do. I am going to need to go over X, Y, and Z records. We're going to have to go over the story a number of times. I'm going to have to be in touch with the person you're accusing. Without truth, without the truth of what the reporting craft requires and what the story itself will require to be credible, to represent the survivor as she would like to be represented and as the story needs, um, trust falls apart. And in fact, uh, the betrayal of trust that sexual assault represents only gets replicated. And I think this is sometimes where reporters fall down. They understand and want to be uh, supportive and empathetic. But we also need to be truthful about what stories require. Liz, I think you mentioned that it was a little, your experience, your initial experience with journalists was a little different in the sense that you went public. So. How, how did that work for you? It didn't sound like it was a great experience, and I'd, I'd sort of like to know more about that. I think what's important in realizing that going public, while it seems and is uh, really important, because the less people that go public, the more shame and stigma is associated with sexual assault, and then you know we're, we all lose whether journalists or survivors or the movement, 
um, I found, and when I first went public, it was with a small arts weekly in Charlottesville, and it was before my case was even adjudicated, and it was The Hook, and a wonderful and intrepid reporter named Courtney Stewart, who has gone on to do fantastic things, and just, you know, The Hook is now defunct. Um, and it was just, I, what I didn't expect was the backlash. Um, regardless how much of set was done and how much best practices were done. And, and she wasn't a cub reporter. She was a very wonderful reporter in a very small market who was doing it right. That said, the shock at which, and certainly, you know, blogs and commenting and, you know, it's a different space than if we were talking about this 20 years ago. The complete and utter hatred and taking down of a victim, regardless of how well you tell the story, is going to happen. So I think one of the great things that we can teach or tell when we talk about the empathy piece is, you know, you do, because a lot of times a, a, a survivor or victim, I don't, I don't get hung up on the word, but people do, um, is to say, isn't this, they feel very empowered, like I'm going to tell my story and it's going to be great and it's going to set me free. And there, there's so much of that happening. And the journalist, of course, is like, this is going to be great. But what happens is that the, the, the variable that none of us can control is the average Joe sitting in their basement online at night and thinking this is all wrong and all survivors of sexual assault are just liars and you know and while those people have always existed they now have a bigger platform and as of November 19th of 2014 last year they have a huge platform um, even though we're repairing from that and I think what didn't go so well for me was the supreme and utter shock of like well why why aren't people feeling empathy and why aren't people behind this and why are we as a nation biased against survivors of any sort of gender-based violence whether we're male or female sometimes I'm a little bit homocentric in my use of the word of she but I mean he and she um, also domestic violence victims it's always you know show me the receipts Show me the receipts. Oh, Ray Rice, this happened? Oh, it did happen now that we see this piece in the elevator. We see it with our own eyes because video. And that, to me, has been some of the most problematic part. It's like, and, and even then, the Twitter sphere has been so awful. So, you know, when you... I, I know, I'm, I'm going no, no, on a little no. tangent. I just want to make sure that people understand the... You have a pretty... Uh, what I would consider an exceptional experience because you were brutally assaulted in 84 and if I'm tell me if I'm wrong but uh, more than 20 years later you got an apology of some sort mm -hmm. from your attacker and was it at that point in 2005 that you went public or had you gone public earlier I had gone public uh, with my school newspaper and Gail Wald who was the editor-in-chief of the University Journal at UVA has gone on to do great things, is still a wonderful journalist. I had banged the pots and pans for as long as I could, but it was the first time I had gone public in a way that could be seen nationally. And basically all anybody wanted to know, not journalists, all anything American people wanted to know was, well, he apologized, so she should forgive him. Like, not that this is part of a criminal justice situation, but... You know, this is about forgiveness, and it was all about, well, you went to a party, you were not in your room reading the Bible, so you deserved it. I received hundreds of emails that said, you deserve to get raped. Uh, I should come to your house and murder you. And I think, not to scare our subjects when we talk to them or counsel them through something like rain or serve justice or one in four, I think it's important that when those survivors do go forward and while it is freeing and empowering and to tell those stories it is it is the art of storytelling that's what we're doing it's you can't predict what's going to happen with that particular story but it's important to know that that could be the outcome for that person and how are they going to care for themselves how is the journalist or the or the counselor going to care for themselves seeing what they've put out into the world has become somewhat of a disaster even though it's a beautiful piece and deserves all of the accolades when there are 
quite frankly, some idiots with a big, loud voice out there who are going to say awful, truly terrible things. But it's like anything. In this country, you can stand up and say, I like Coke or I like Pepsi, and someone's going to go down and say, you deserve to die. So, you know, I mean, that's just, if you have an opinion, it's going to get excoriated. So, you know, that's, coming forward in 2005 is when I got the most heat, yes. Chen, when, when you uh, advise victims, do you encourage them to talk to journalists? Do you warn them about the kind of backlash that Liz encountered? And what kind of re reactions do you get? And, and how has that worked for people? Sure. Um, you know, in talking with survivors through our crisis intervention services, um, you know, encouraging them to talk to the media doesn't fit into that context very well. <laughs> that being said, we do have a robust, what we call our speakers bureau. So these are survivors who have said, part of my recovery, part of my healing will be telling my story, whether that's to a high school in Maine or to the New York Times. So we have media who come to us who say, we're looking for a survivor of campus sexual assault who's a male, and we check our speakers bureau to see if there's anybody in there who'd be willing to speak. Um, when we do have members of our speakers bureau who do do media interviews, we talk to them about things like avoiding social media, not reading the comments section of online pieces, um, and, and simply in the same way, you know, you hear a lot of celebrities now saying like, oh, I just can't take all the negativity in social media, so I stay off. The very same guidance, because as Liz pointed out, um, it just takes one person to kind of go off on the rail. And, and you know, happily, the comments section of a lot of daily news sites is, is quickly fading into as a mm -hmm. thing that a lot of people are dropping it now. Yeah. This may mean that trolls are going to have to find another hobby. You know? Right, <laughs> right. You know, I was very interested in, in sort of the, uh, certainly the journalist role is to kind of the, the part, the tea part, the truth part. Um, and I wondered, uh, for all of you, though, you're all, uh, you know, you're, you're people that are listening and meeting with survivors and victims. Are there red flags that happen, that uh, landmines that you see when you hear a story that immediately, you know, your defenses go up a little and you're thinking, well, maybe this person isn't the best person story to tell. And I know um, Liz has been involved in the, uh, the notorious Rolling Stone story in terms of her initial uh, thinking, uh, not approval, but her initial buying into it and then her growing skepticism. So I wanted to get a sense of what those, what those signals are, what those landmines may be. I'll take it, um, <laughs> simply because I, I flamed out rather nationally with, um, you know, I, I think when you've, and I've grown up a great deal, maybe because I then grew my journalistic wings in, in the eight years of advocacy, um, I didn't read the piece because I had spoken with the author for many, many hours and weeks and months and knew what it was going to be. And I know the word trigger is overused, but it's a thing. Um, and I felt like, you know what, I'm not ready to read this piece because I knew the story was mirroring my own. And I felt as though, well, I don't need to. So when I was asked by the Daily Beast to write a piece saying, you know, I believe this story, I did because such a story had indeed happened to me. And so when the whole thing started to fall apart very, very quickly, and my esteemed colleague Richard Bradley was the first to, to take note of that um, and attacked me, and I was like, Richard, calm down. Um, I think the red flags were there. When I did sit down, I believe it was on December 4th, to read the whole piece, I noticed many red flags. But I think in the bigger question, and then I wrote a piece for, for – um, the Washington Post saying, you know, I have to back away from this and I can't lend my support any longer. Simple things like the layout of the actual house in that piece. Um, um, the idea that someone would have had, you know, hundreds of injuries from, from broken glass. But again, it, you know, so where are the medical reports? You know, again, it's sort of, I feel badly, but it's sort of show me the receipts. But these to me 
were things that I said, well, and I asked the reporter, I, I don't want to name her because I'm still involved in the litigation with the two lawsuits. Um, you know, did you go to the house? Did you walk around the house? Because the things that I noticed were things only I could notice. There is no side stairway or side doorway. And so when I was reading that, it was with so much horror. I know that the people who were first taking down the piece, and my friend Hannah Rawson, who I love, you know, colleagues, and I wasn't angry with them. I was like, that's fine. That's your reality as a journalist. I'm wearing my victim hat right now, and I see exactly how this could have happened. And when I did read it, um, and I understand your point, Bruce, about, you know, talking to the accused and the rights of the accused, and I, too, believe that that's very important. My whole vision of eight years ago of first always believe, and I don't want anyone to think that that's not valid, is now tempered. I don't want people to say, first be skeptical, but I want journalists to sort of back it up, and I think that was such a teachable moment for us. Um, and in moving forward, perhaps the fragility or the unwillingness. And I know a lot of people have said, well, she came to Sabrina, excuse me, and said, I don't want to be a part of this any longer. But I don't know any journalist who wouldn't at that point still, I, I would have still, I'm going to ask you, would you have still moved forward with the story? Yeah. No? If she had said, I lied or I did not tell the truth or I'm not comfortable. I mean, at what point do you say this is not working out? And I think that there were so many red flags and that's a really long and roundabout way. And I know Bruce has something yeah, well, to well, say. Well, no, no, but this is, I think, I, I think important. And without actually making it specific to any story, yeah, I, I think it's, it specific, well, no, no, but, but, but there to. are, but I think there are a few things that I've certainly seen. Um, one of them, first of all, it is, it is not a red flag in terms of credibility, but is a red flag in terms of journalistic obligations when a protagonist says, I don't want to be part of the story. It's very common in, in trauma survivors to have a kind of approach and avoidance, push and pull. I want to tell, but I, no one will believe me. I want to talk, but I can't talk. Approach, and I, I mean, Chris and I have talked about this. It's, it's very common for survivors to be very cooperative and then have a last minute panic and pull out and then come back in. And that, I mean, this is, this pushing and pulling is part of the story, and but it does engage a certain level of journalistic obligation. I would also say that the single most important risk factor for journalists doing this kind of work of making ethical or craft error or getting it wrong somehow is not paying enough attention to boundaries. I think, I think there's a tendency sometimes to want to uh, embrace survivors or even be I intimidated by their injuries, their psychological injury, and, 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 not, um, and develop a different kind of relationship with them than we have with other kinds of sources and other kinds of protagonists. That's when you're in a danger zone. In fact, by and large, um, victims of sexual assault and other kinds of trauma need us to maintain our boundaries and do our jobs. It's, and it's better for them in the long run, even if it's not as emotionally satisfying in the moment. And, and when you allow those boundaries to collapse and follow different rules or follow or fall into very personal relationships while the story is going on, that's when you're setting yourself up for errors in news judgment, errors in fact checking, errors in character judgment, whatever, you, and narrative errors, right? Um, I don't know if that's what happened with the Rolling Stone piece. It feels like that's what happened, but I don't know. Um, but I would say that the times that reporters have spoken to me about things that have gone badly, it's almost always at its root a, a boundary problem when they go really, really bad. Jen, when you vet your Speakers Bureau folk, what do you do? What, what is that process like? Mm -hmm. We don't do an investigation into their story. Essentially, if folks 
want to share, they submit an application that outlines some basic demographics, um, a, a short narrative to accompany their story, um, and then we do the matching. But essentially that fact-checking, that onus for that does rely on the journalist. We're, we're not in the business of having to be that skeptic. Do you, do you make that clear to the journalists who come to you? I believe we do, yes. Mm -hmm. That would be important. I want to give the people in the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, I have lots, uh, but we can open it up now for questions, and then I will always come back if we don't have enough. And there's a gentleman right here. Well, it's actually my colleague, Angela Lee. Okay. okay. Um, before we came here, my colleague, Angela Lee, who is the communications director for Serve Justice, and I were actually having a conversation about the Rolling Stone article. And she raised a very good point to me, is there should be some type of training for journalists. And I know there's this session, but is there any type of training like this that could or should be available either through journalism schools or through professional development? And I know, Kristen, I think you, I think you have an interesting record with me. I think, I think we spent six hours on the phone once. <laughs> That's my recollection, with you just soaking everything in. And I realize most reporters don't have that luxury of that kind of time. But that would be a great way to share this important message. And I was wondering, particularly to you, Mr. Shapiro, if, if, are, is there anything like that? Yeah, well, yeah. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a big part of what the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma does, www.dartcenter.org. Uh, thank you for the free ad. No. Um, www.dartcenter.org. Um, first of all, actually, on our website, we have loads and loads of tip sheets and educational resources for journalists who are in the mid or students who are in the midst of stories and projects. They include um, video Q and A's with with Kristen and some writing by her. Video Q and A's with advocates and survivors. A lot stuff with psychologists on what it is we're dealing with here. Secondly, the DART Center runs its own um, a fellowship program. It's a week long that Kristen's been a part of and others, 15 journalists a year, come to Columbia University for. We do sometimes special topic seminars on things like covering sexual assault. Uh, we're not the only ones. The Pointer Institute uh, in Florida has also done stuff on this that's very, very good in partnership with us. And a growing number of journalism schools actually now include trauma reporting in their curricula. So th there really is a, this, this conversation that we're having here today is one that is um, not universally available, but is much more available than it was 10 years ago. If you go to the meetings of organizations like uh, Society of Professional Journalists or investigative reporters and editors, pretty much every year now there will be a panel that touches on sexual violence or other kinds of trauma and raises these issues. And one of the things I'm most proud of um, with the DART Center over the years is we've, we've been able to build bridges between survivor net networks, experts of various sorts, and journalists for sometimes public conversations like this, sometimes very quiet backroom conversations about how to develop good working relationships. We did a whole booklet for clinicians whose clients want to talk to the media about how to make those encounters more productive. Um, so there, there are resources, and it is an area where journalists, where we need to improve our toolkit, and we need to do it um, sort of systematically. So. Thank you for asking. I would just add that um, I did take, uh, I was a fellow at the DART Center um, early on, I think it was 2003, so before I even did the Campus Rape series. And it is, I believe, one of the reasons why I was able to do the Campus Rape series. Um, I learned a lot about um, trauma and how it affects the brain. Um, and because of the support I had uh, from the psychologists and psychiatrists affiliated with the DART Center, I was able to talk through a lot of what was happening while we were reporting. Uh, we had students um, that, you know, required often months of negotiation to get them to come forward and talk with us, or uh, students who agreed to be interviewed, but once the reporting dragged on, they backed away. We had some who literally disappeared on us. 
Um, and, you know, this would be even after they had given us documents, told us their story on video or audio. Um, you know, these were points when we didn't need them anymore, which is why I say uh, I know we would not go forward, because we had these discussions at the time. Of should you go forward? It's a very big ethical question when you don't necessarily need um, the, the survivor to be cooperative anymore. Um, but conversations with people like Frank Ockbert helped me to understand this, this pull, this give and take, uh, I think he calls it avoidance and acceptance. This Appro con approach and avoidance. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, constantly going on. So um, I would highly recommend it. But the one thing I do want to say to all the reporters in the room is um, this topic is emotionally charged and it's sensitive, but it's really not different than any other topic that you would cover in the sense that when you talk to a source, you want to corroborate everything that source says, and you want to do it through documents primarily, if you're an investigative reporter like me, paper trails, everything. And so, you know, you know, these are the kinds, if you have that mindset to begin with early on, these are the things that prevent a Rolling Stone scenario, every single case that we featured um, was fully uh, backed up by paper. And, and that's iron tight. Um, not only were we honest with victims about the, the reporting process and what it would take, but we got people to sign um, privacy waivers and disclosure waivers so that we could file records requests for their disciplinary files, or we could file um, disclosure waivers asking school officials to talk to us about their case so we could get all sides of the story. And they understood, and I think uh, Laura Dunn is here and she could speak very eloquently about this, they understood how important it was for their story to be ironclad um, so that the rest of the world would look at this, not just uh, look at their case and believe them, but see the series for what it was, which was an exposure of systemic failures. One of the interesting things for me, and I just I need to add this, is that for all of the focus on a story gone spectacularly wrong, we are in some sense in, I, mean, I hate to use this word, but I'm going to use it anyway, we are in a golden age of reporting on sexual assault. I mean, in the sense that if you go back to uh, uh, 15 years to the Boston Archdiocese reporting and forward, there has never in the history of journalism been the kind of sustained, systematic, ethically excellent, high impact reporting on institutional failures around sexual assault mm -hmm. that we have seen. We, ESPN has done spectacular reporting. Uh, Al Jazeera too, but sexual, um, ESPN, uh, sexual assault in sports. Mm -hmm. The work that Kristen and her colleagues have done on university campuses. Uh, sexual assault in the military that the Denver Post and many others have done now. This is, this kind of reporting didn't exist prior to the late 90s, early 2000s. It's all been invented and developed and there's a lot of best practice out there to look at. So while we can get very hung up on big, mis big visible mistakes, it's important to remember that there are a lot of people to learn from in many newsrooms out there doing it right and many examples of successful collaboration and of an interesting dynamic between advocates and survivors and journalists and public perception. You, you mentioned earlier the, the, sort of the Cosby effect of reporting. I was thinking about this just yesterday because uh, Police Commissioner Bratton in New York City was on a radio show talking about how the number of reported rapes in New York City has gone up, but then he was quick to say it's because so many women are now reporting historic cases. Mm -hmm. And that's because of what they've seen in the media mm -hmm. about Cosby. Yeah. And Bruce, I'd like to say for us, I think the crescendo really started to grow with the Sandusky case. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. I don't think it's let up since. It, it just, you know, the media requests that are consistently that, that, coming that, in. Yeah. And even with that case, I don't know if folks recall, but there was a a blogger who had exposed uh, a few of the victims' names. And none of the mainstream media decided to expose that. It was student journalists who really 
moved it forward. Mm-hmm. At yeah, first. but there was an right. opportunity there where that right. you know they could have started digging into this right. victim's life, and and it, there was a unanimous decision not to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the use of the term alleged victim. As a lawyer, I know that crimes are alleged and defendants are alleged to have done them. I have no understanding of why a victim is alleged to be so, and doesn't that reinforce not believing in the first place? I think this is good, and, and I think it opens up a discussion of do words matter, the words you use in, in writing about this and talking about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go, go. Um, I'm trying to think uh, when we, we used it. I know we use alleged perpetrator a lot. Um, I would say that journalists are probably very careful. Libel law is uh, a huge reality. And uh, it could be, you know, lawyers uh, insisting if these were not uh, victims who filed reports, actually filed a police report, um, that you use alleged victim. Um, I don't think that we, I try to stay away from it. I try to say, um, you know, so-and-so who filed a rape report. Um, but I always say alleged perpetrator unless somebody was actually convicted. Well, you know, alleged, alleged implies there's an allegation. Yeah. Uh, an allegation that someone has done something. And we use it as reporters as kind of legal cover for a system of, with the presumption of innocence, right? It's, it's code for the presumption of innocence. I suppose if we, if truth is profoundly in contention around a particular case and there hasn't been a police report or there, you know, we would then want some parallel term, but it's not gonna be alleged. Um, it's, it, it will be, you know, claimed or, yeah. Something I don't, I don't quite know what it is, but I do. I think it's an important question. Language does matter. You know, the the survivor victim one is one you can go around endlessly on. It's a very complex one, and I personally think there are times when one or the other is more appropriate. Um, kind of beyond the scope of what we can do now, I think. But I agree. Um, from a victim survivor based place, if I ever read about myself or another victim and I agree with Laura alleged victim feels so it like a stab in the heart um when when you're trusting a journalism I believe there are many other ways to say it and I I like what both of you said I think it's perfect um because I think the point is in the overwhelming majority of these cases we don't have a paper trail we don't have a police report we don't have any sort of formal complaint where we can use the words we want to use in best practices so that's why i think it's such a highly charged um you know you can't even say complaining witness uh you know what i mean you you can always say yeah exactly you know she says just say according according to and you know it probably is shorthand i'm sure it's it's uh it's considered shorthand and that's you know um i think uh the more journalists cover this and especially the more their editors and copy editors and proofreaders um are involved, these kinds of conversations happen. I mean, I remember when we were doing the Campus Rape uh, series, um, you know, we had an intern who was working on our um, series who was reading the drafts who said, you know, you say claim, she claims, maybe she just say says. And we actually had a very serious discussion about it with our lawyer and um, our editors, and we all decided, okay, you're right, we should say says. Because you know, when you when you have not been the victim of a sexual assault, you don't you're not as attuned to it. You know, you're not as um, plugged into it. And um, you know, quite honestly, there are a lot of editors that are, um, you know, male and um, you know don't see a difference between claims and says. I mean, my editor pretty much admitted that. You know. And uh, said, you know, after you know, she she raised some good points, and we're going to say this. And um, and so, you know, it it just takes being hyper aware. But I mean, that's a that's you know, the more you do the stories, the more you become aware of those kinds of uh, that that kind of effect, the wor- the effect of words. Hi, uh, um, I want to ask you if you would address institutional tolerance in our own industry. Uh, specifically related to what you just said, gender imbalances, 
in the newsroom, editorially, um, during the course of the Rolling Stone story, all of the critiques that were leveled against the Rolling Stone, <coughs> excuse me, at a bird's eye view, can really be leveled across the board in the media industry. I mean, in this room, we have less than 20% of the room are men. And as women journalists, we encounter resistance all the time to our language, to our word choice, to our storytelling choices. And so how, how would you advise a young person in a newsroom who is looking at a board full of men who are much more tolerant in general to ideas that are rape myth accepting? Um, how, how do they navigate that? Because I think it's a, a huge obstacle. We're here because feminist activism in the 70s led to newsrooms that were more diverse in the 80s and 90s. We're really here, I would say, because the rapes of boys and men became undeniable in the military, in the church, in the Sandusky case, not because the rapes of women were being treated legitimately. So how would you advise a young person, particularly one with an intersectional lens, because we haven't touched on race, which is so salient to rape, um, how would you advise them to navigate that internally? Anyone? First of all, it's such yeah. a brilliant question. Yeah. I, I mean, it really is. And I think the focus on, well, yes, it did come, sorry, I have a piece of ice in my mouth, you know, from Sandusky and, and, and you know, Gagan. And, and everyone does talk about those proud 11 witnesses who came forward. And we, talk, and we congratulate ourselves for not outing them um, even though some blogger tried to. I think when you're talking about young, I think today's young people are going into journalism, are probably learning uh, in a different way. And if you look at, even if you look at the film Spotlight or any film, let's go back to all the president's men and move forward and, and looking at gender biases and race biases, all, all very, very, very important. I think what we've come to realize is that we are all, no matter where we are in our careers, we are all learning each and every day. And the best that we can do is to say each night, did I tell this story to the best of my ability? Was I fair to the survivor? Was I fair to the accuser? Was I fair to the accused? And how can I do it better tomorrow? And I know that seems like a big kind of flowers and light sort of answer, but I really do think that we're all learning about this on a daily basis. And, and, and sometimes we won't get it right and sometimes we will. So, but I'm gonna defer to my esteemed colleagues here on oh. this one. Well, no, it is the, this is a critical question. I mean, I, I'm gonna put on a slightly different hat. I also teach ethics at, at Columbia Journalism School. And I kind of, I view my job as very limited. It's to enable them to, to locate articulate and stand up for their views on ethical questions like this one in the course of their work. Uh, one of the things that my students and I spend a lot of time talking about are the ways in which your own identity and experiences are relevant or not relevant to the work that you do in the newsroom. One of the ways that it is relevant and why it's important to kind of, if you're a young reporter, think about who you are is because your identity gives you an authority, and you have to be willing to speak about it. You have to be willing to talk about it, sometimes even if it may seem to threaten your position. There's been some very, and this is important on, on the sexual assault story or on trauma, because there's a profound overlap between sort of psychological distress from covering bad stuff, and what clinicians and researchers are now calling moral injury, a sense of being complicit in violation when we are not addressing things with our own best craft and ethical standards. Um, it's in reporters' own interests, both career-wise, but also just in terms of their own self-care, to make ethical demands upon themselves and their colleagues. And uh, it should be part of normal newsroom conversation. Journalists in, at the university level need to be learning to exercise those muscles. Journalists in newsrooms need to be learning to exercise those muscles. And it's a, look, it's a challenge. This is 
an era where young reporters go into jobs knowing that they are probably not going to be able to work at the same place for very long. Now, the, that brings a certain vulnerability. I don't want to lose my job. On the other hand, the knowledge that you're in a kind of churning economy also may bring a certain amount of, well, F you and the horse you rode in on. We're going to do the right thing here, right? Um, but that sense of self-awareness, that is both ethical self-awareness and identity self-awareness of, and, 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 and of listening to your own radar and speaking about it to colleagues, speaking up when you see something going wrong is important. Equally important is um, talking to peers about it. And that's the other thing I spend a lot of time with my students on, is getting people comfortable talking to their peers when things bother them. One of the characteristics of ethical crises in journalism, not just on sexual violence, but on other things, wire, uh, phone hacking, other kinds of things, is that people don't know they're in an ethical crisis until it's too late. Sort of just to follow up with that then, in, in terms of you know when you're preparing, especially for this type of a story, is it important that the journalists sort of check themselves for race bias, gender bias, class bias, just to see how it must might affect how they're perceiving what they're hearing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. I'm fine with that. And we have. Uh, I'm a student journalist at the University of Maryland, uh, and I'm working on a uh, story that I plan on developing next semester about male victims of uh, sexual assault and rape on college campuses. I had a question about uh, the ethics and possible conflict of interest, because the inspiration for me to do this story was uh, last ju uh, July. Um, I was victimized by uh, a person I thought was my friend. and. Um, I was wondering if uh, that experience would disqualify me from working on this story. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry for what happened to you, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, I th my own view on this is that it depends, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, knowing your own reactions and motivations can, can be a very powerful engine for reporting as long as you know that it also obligates you to bend over backwards to see the parts of the story that maybe you don't want to see or that you wouldn't naturally be drawn to. It's kind of like I have a friend who was uh, one of the reporters uh, at the New Orleans Times-Picayune during Hurricane Katrina. and. Uh, you know, 40% of the newsroom was displaced uh, during the storm. And I was down visiting him some months afterwards, and the guy was just on a tear about the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Just, we were out for dinner, and he's like in a rage. Now, his job was to cover reconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you, you, I have to ask you, you're so angry. How do you do this? And he said, well, you better believe I'm angry, but because I know it and can say it, I also know that I need to go the extra mile to be uh, to, to check my own premises, to check my facts, to get the other side. I I I push myself harder because of my own biases. Now, sometimes when you're really uh, affected by an experience, you're in a good position to do that, and sometimes you're not. And that would be, I guess, the question I would put back at you. As a brief follow-on to what Bruce said, who better, who better than you to write about this topic because of your experience? And then there's the flip side. I think the answer to it is, yes, great editors are the answer to this sort of question. I think what you can put forth may be a lot more brilliant than, and, and I don't mean to be biased because I think that there are people covering sexual assault who are not survivors of sexual assault and do it better than sometimes I ever can. But when I put on my writing hat, there are times when I know I need to step away from a story because I can't. I, I can't serve it the justice that it needs to be served or I'm stuck or it's triggering or it's traumatizing um, or it's not even about 
something emotional, but I can't give it the gravitas that it needs to be given, and another journalist can do it better. That said, for the most part, if you're surrounded by the right people and you have the right checks and balances in your own mind and the right awareness of your own bias, you can make serious brilliance out of pieces like that. I might also suggest that you, you could disclose that as part of your piece. My organization actually does prevention training on college campuses and at on or various organizations on sexual assault and uh, domestic violence, all on the prevention aspect. And I believe that the one in five statistic is probably even higher now that the Clery Act is being enforced and college campuses are actually having to report. So I have a feeling once those numbers come out again, it's going to be even crazier. So my question is, is in terms of the prevention aspects, I rarely see reporting on the prevention either on its own or coupled with other incidents. And and I, I have so much to say about it. And, and no one seems interested in talking about the prevention versus the aftermath. And I think that more conversations need to happen so that we can avoid more of these incidents and there won't need to be reporting done. Can you give us the name of your organization? Sure. It's girlonfire.life. And we do all kinds of training. And it's for men and women, actually, on campuses and, and also in large venues and organizations. I should say it's, it's my understanding that one of the, uh, maybe you can amplify this, I think one of the major academic networks in the country, and I can't remember which one it is now, is working on a big study or or literature review on on evidence based best practices for campus sexual assault prevention and i when that comes out in the next year or so that's going to be something really that i hope gets a lot of coverage and that journalists should be looking out for because um we don't do enough i think you're right we we are very good at focusing the spotlight on what goes wrong but we don't do enough to focus not only on what is being done, but what is actually known about what works. And there's a fair amount that's known about what works. And that's actually relevant because there are the kind of big, sometimes very emotional arguments on college campuses about what faculty, the responsibilities of faculty administration are. There's a lot of fear around it. There's a lot of layers of bureaucracy. I myself, as a university bureaucrat, have to go to these briefings, and some of them are good, and some of them make me roll my eyes, right? So yes, it's important. Uh, so my question is mostly for Kristen. Um, because you've reported, it seems when you were describing your reporting on sexual assault, um, you you did talk a lot about sort of being the first to uh, get at very specific communities, like you were saying, the um, Hasidic Jewish community. Um, I think, at least in my own experiences, it seems like it's becoming a lot easier to report on campus sexual assault just because there is so much reporting on it right now, um, in large part to the work that you did in 2010. Um, but my question is, how do you get at those other communities that aren't currently being covered? You know, the Associated Press just uh, a month or two ago put out that investigation about sexual misconduct by police officers and how I've sort of seen a couple of stories trickle out about that. And, you know, you have the cases like Daniel Holtzclaw, where he's charged with so many uh, offenses that it gets national attention. But how how would you, if if you were to try to sort of break into a community to get those stories, how would you recommend going about that? Or do you just sort of have to wait for people to come to you and no, hope you that... don't wait for people to okay. come to you. Um, I mean, um, most of the stories that I've done, you're right, um, they share a common theme. It's penetrating a shrouded institution, and it's also approaching victims who have serious trust issues, and most of them don't want to talk about it anymore. Most of the time um, when I've done these, um, when I've looked at sexual assault in the institution that I've looked at, uh, it's it's before, you know, um, it becomes a topic where it's easier. I think definitely it's easier to cover campus sexual assault now than when we were doing it in 2008, 2009. Um, and I really just would recommend finding out uh, and developing sources with those who intersect with the victims you're looking to find. Um, that's what we did with Campus Assault. That's what I did with the church abuse victims. I went to 
Um, <laughs> the lawyers that were handling cases, I went to uh, advocates who work on and off campus. I went to parents who had, you know, sometimes, you know, put up websites or created blogs. Um, I went to activist groups and and um, and said, this is what I would like to cover and, and I need help in finding um, um, people. And really, if you, if you go uh, and develop sources um, who circle around the community that you're looking to, to break into, you will break into them. I mean, if you're very sincere and you're very honest about what it is you're trying to do, you will find help, but you have to do it. And really, just think systematically about first of all, where dissidents from particular communities yes. express their feelings. Uh, support it, groups. You know, are there support groups? Are there publications? Are there, you know, there's, there are places where dissidents express their views. But also, um, you know, you can go to broader range um, sexual assault organizations and say, is there yes. anyone in X? What do you know about X community? Because very often people, right, will have crossed Rain's we actually doorstep or others. contacted Rain in the very beginning. I mean, you know, we went V-Day, because V-Day has, yeah. you know, yeah. campus groups. Um, take back the night events. You know, like, you just have to think, where can I find uh, people from this community? Every community has one, military, you know, every... And, and, and think about also, if you know the institutions of a particular community, mm -hmm. which kind of which institutional part silo is going to be responsible for handling complaints and issues that come forward. Mm -hmm. Because chances are one of two things is going to be true. Either there's someone in that silo who cares a lot and feels as if the institution is, is not doing the right thing and wants to talk to you, or there's someone in that silo who's part of the problem, right? But figuring out how power works what leaders or structures are protected, what leaders are restruct or structures are in fact chains of accountability, mm -hmm. that's also critical. Yeah, like you're looking for your whistleblowers, basically. We have another question. I understand that the focus of this particular presentation is on, in effect, more uh, perfecting your methods for laying out the facts mm -hmm. on a situation. But sexual assault is not like rain. And um, you talk about institutional failure. And I, and I wonder what you feel your responsibility is going to the next step, which is uh, trying to get at the reasons for the institutional failure. One could, for example, look at uh, uh, sexual assault as anti-competitive behavior. Uh, does it uh, work as a form of terrorism? Uh, why is there no coverage of the sexual assault, which is the very basis of prostitution? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, you know, this is a big question, and, you, and I understand that that is not the focus of this presentation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on, on yeah. where to take it next? Yeah, I actually, um, at our organization, we receive media requests every day. Um, and more and more so, we're seeing folks who are doing this investigative journalism around institutions on these community-based levels. So it's somebody who believes that a small, rural, private school has an issue around this topic, or there's a club sports team that seems to be, um, you know, there's like murmurs of inappropriate behavior. Um, and the questions that we get from the journalists working on these stories um, are very thoughtful in terms of what do you think um, uh, allows an offender to move from institution to institution? What systemic issues do we have in relation to sex offender registries um, that we should be addressing as not just local communities, but for issues like that? nationally, you know, and these issues cross states um, in all sorts of strata of, of our, our country. So 
I think these questions are being asked. These systemic questions are being asked. And I think in, in larger, more prominent publications, but also on, on these smaller local publications as well. We I agree. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Just even this morning, I saw a piece which I think, and I don't even know what I was watching, and they were talking about there is a high school basketball team, and in they Tennessee. said in Tennessee, mm-hmm. and they called it a hazing ritual. Mm-hmm. And one of the youngest victims was raped using a pool cue and required an eight hour surgery and an eight day hospital stay. When are we going? It's about language. How is that hazing? This is a sexual assault and or rape issue. So I think that, you know, even if we talk from the bottom down, and and it also has to do with, you know, things like um, sex workers um, and and the assault of them and, and, and those who have been trafficked. When are we going to, when is the bigger picture going to be about calling, is it, you know, there are acts of terrorism. And we talk about it, of course, in third world countries, and we talk about it, you know, in the Sudan and in Syria, but here we are in America, and we're talking about children being trafficked, and we're talking about sex workers who are being raped continually, and that that is something that we need to cover on a systemic basis and journalistically. I would say in the past year alone, I've probably done at least five interviews related to um, sex workers being assaulted by law enforcement. Um, and that number, that interest continues to grow. Again, some of them just local, and then others some more prominent in-depth investigative pieces. So I think we're in a in the very great place where we get to see this landscape view of the work that journalists are doing. And again, I just I keep at it because it's yeah. really fantastic. I, I, I would just add that at least in my experience, most of the reporters who are, I mean, including Kristen, but many others who are doing excellent work, sometimes unknown outside their own local newsrooms on the subject of sexual assault, have very deep motivations and think a lot about the nature of injustice and understand that that they're doing this work for a reason uh, and because they want to see some big changes in the power structure. Um, now, the nature of journalism is to be more termite-like. We tend not to traffic much in big theories. We tend to approach stories a fact at a time, a story at a time, and lay out lines of accountability for abuse and injustice with the kind of crazy faith that society and intellectuals and citizens will carry it forward to the level of politics, to the level of theory, to the level of argument. But I think that when you see these stories at the local level um, and see people, see reporters trying to uh, engage best practices on sexual assault, you actually are seeing those big questions that you are asking being put into action. And I, you know, I think it's very important to remember that actually the, in many ways in this country, awareness of sexual assault as an issue was the work of a journalist, a radical journalist named Susan Brown Miller, who wrote Against Our Will, Men, Women and Rape in 1975. Susan Brown Miller was a writer for Newsweek, but who also wrote what is in some ways the sort of the silent spring of, 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 sexual violence awareness. So there's a a constant intersection between journalism, activism, advocacy, and the kind of analytic thinking that you're talking about. We don't have time for too many, but I will certainly take your questions. Thank you. Um, Speaking of best practices, and I teach um, journalism and have been fortunate to have Liz visit my classes. <clears throat> Could Liz and Kristen provide some examples of what not to ask and how to best phrase questions when you are sitting down to do that interview? Well, I don't think of it in terms of what not to ask. Um, I think of it mostly as a listening exercise, at least in the very beginning. Um, and I often... Um, uh, you know, interview um, victims 
on multiple uh, occasions, you know, over multiple um, interviews. So I never think of, of an interview as it's all or nothing in this one setting, and I think that helps. Um, I always start with, I think, I try to start with the least threatening uh, information that I need, which is, you know, for me, a lot of my intersection in interviewing uh, rape victims is, is an aftermath interview. You know, um, sometimes it's decades after the fact uh, in the case of clergy abuse, and sometimes it's years or months after. Um, and so it's, it's never immediately after. And there has, uh, I think, been enough time um, that, that what they're doing now, I really do want to know. And so I start with, with who they are now and, and get them talking about who they are now and, and work my way backwards. Um, I typically um, let victims talk as much as they want about the actual assault. Um, I rely a lot on documents um, and what what they have reported to police or um, you know the institution that they've come forward to. Um, I don't ask a lot of questions about that because my focus, like Bruce has mentioned, is is really an in, the institutional response. Um, but um, I uh, never shy away from the hard questions. Um, you know, whatever the accused student or the accused priest has said about uh, the, the rape allegation, I discuss, you know, I ask about. Um, but I don't do it first. You know, it's not the first thing I do. And um, I, I allow, this, I think, space and time so that if, um, if you know, emotion, you know, victims, you know, it's just too hard for them to discuss at the moment, that's fine. You know, we'll come back to it. Um, to give them the time and space so that they can really kind of confront what is difficult. Um, and, you know, really simple questions um, is my motto, like, and then what happened? And when you came forward, what happened? What happened is like the best question you could ask. And like I said, listening, reporters think, oh, what kind of question do I, I you know, like we need to come to an, every interview with 20 questions and they have to be hard, um, you know, and, and well-crafted questions. And really just listening for these interviews, listening and letting your questions um, come to you as you listen, I've found uh, have been the most fruitful. I get the most detail I could ever imagine. I get people telling me stuff I don't want to know. Um, you know, because it's too much detail. Um, and so that's kind of my, my motto. That is so perfect. And the way Kristen approaches an interview is absolutely the way it should be done because having been interviewed hundreds of times, I find that all of a sudden, I'll just find myself talking. I'm like, what am I saying? And like the most horrible things that you would never, but because she has, or the journal has set up that trust and is listening, that's so important. Um, but to the point that Linda asked, and because I think it, it is very important, but God bless you, both of you, because you do it right. For every do it right, there is do it wrong, um, whether it's broadcast or print or, or whatever. Um, I've been asked before, so I'm wrapping up this series, and I was wondering, do you have any photographs of your rapist, like, you know, on your phone that you could provide to me? Um, wow. Going back to document, and this is not, you know, a 21-year-old intern in a newsroom. This was a 40-something seasoned producer of a major news magazine. Um, I'm trying to just give really specific examples right now, not for the shock value, but I think, I think sometimes that's important on what not to do. Or, you know, the typical, so what were you wearing? Um, you know, I have defense attorneys who cross-examined me and you know, did that, you know, did that for you. Um, to just not doing the research, I'm always stunned at how many reporters come to me having not done the very basics, who don't know a thing about a case or about 
sexual assault in general. And it's like, how did your editor even assign this to you? And I don't mean to sound bitter, but it's just, from a journalism point, I'm just like, what, really? And, um, you know, and also just really basic things. I remember one major, major women's magazine. And, and here's something interesting. Sometimes the women's magazines that we have expected, and again, I'm being homocentric in, in my verbiage, who we expect to be doing the most with the best practices. I think everyone just sort of rushed to say, oh, this is chic right now. Let's all cover it, all the glossies, because it's a dying breed. And, you know, I mean, in the meantime, you know, much more political outfits are doing much better reporting. Um, I spent months on the phone and in person with a reporter, again, a seasoned reporter from uh, a very well-regarded women's magazine who then finally just went radio silent. And I called. I was like, um, we were setting up the photographs and the photo shoot and this, that, and the other. And she was like, oh, that. And it was a huge piece. And we all know who's been, a lot of us know a lot of the people were in the piece. She's like, oh, that, yeah. Oh, we dropped you from that piece. After, like, taking your body and soul out of you for, like, like what had to be 20 hours of interview. She's like, um, you know, you didn't look too downtrodden enough for us. We wanted people who look more pained and aggrieved. And <laughs> it's just like, you know, and, and, and while that might be true, that's something you talk about and maybe in the newsroom, like we're looking for more diversity or more pain on the face or something. Like, no, you wouldn't even talk about that in the newsroom, but it's something that I was just like, but to not follow up and say in a sensitive manner, you know, we've interviewed a lot of survivors and it's a big piece and it's an important piece, but we, we, we can't use you right now. Just, just It goes a long way, especially with survivors who are just starting their journey in speaking with the media, whether it's from a speaker's bureau or from a reporter coming to us. It's just mind-boggling how someone can use that much of your time. Like, this is not, it is my job, but it's not someone's job. And, you know, it takes a lot of bravery for people, especially when they're new to trust you with their story. And thank God for the Bruce's and Kristen's and for the Speakers Bureaus of the World. But man, they're out there and they are important publications and broadcasts and they're doing it. So there, that's what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're at uh, the 2.30 mark and I want to certainly thank our panel, but I also want to thank all of you for asking such wonderful questions. Uh, this ha is, as you can see, being uh, videotaped, so hopefully if you would like a link to the final product, that will be possible. And we, we very much appreciate your participation today, and thank you very much, panelists. Because I think corporations, although we might want to paint them as sometimes dark and bad, at least there is accountability there. Um, and, um, and, and, and serving on boards. I, you know, I'm really proud to be on the board of Serve Justice. We have some lovely people here today who help to adjudicate for those who don't have a voice in secondary school and in collegiate um, places where we talk about sexual assault. Most recently, the Labry case at St. Paul's. Um, as well as I am on the board of one in four. So I, I've sort of taken this all and with age and wisdom tried to make this much more of a positive thing rather than a woe is me telling my story. And, and I know while that's, while that's interesting, I think it's become such a greater topic and in dealing with, and Kristen was one of the, f the first people to ever interview me and that was the most lovely experience. And I've worked also with Rain being on there, Kate Hall and Jen, you guys have been so terrific. So with that rambling introduction of wearing all of the hats, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I would like to say how happy I am to be here as well and um, just how wonderful it is that we're even having this conversation. I think over the past 10 years, um, through my personal experience working at Rain, we've really seen a change in the conversations that we have with the media. And I was talking to Bruce about this beforehand. Uh, we have journalists that are coming to us and 
where they are in terms of their questions and information around the issue of sexual violence is just light years from where it was. Uh, and this issue has received unprecedented attention, I believe, over the past five years, and it just continues, it seems, to grow, um, due in no small part, obviously, to the work from the folks up here in the room and those watching. So I think it's important to underscore that because of that work and that effort and the stories that you all are telling, we continue to see an unprecedented level of people reaching out for help. RAIN created and operates the National Sexual Assault Hotlines, and we, every year, continue to see our highest numbers ever. And so many of those folks, this is the first time that they are reaching out for help. And so many of them, around half, um, especially on our online service, are talking about an assault or abuse that took place five or more years ago. And they're saying things like, I read the story about Cosby. I read this story. I saw this news coverage. So I just can't underscore enough how important it is the work that you all are doing around this topic. Um, thanks very much. I think that that starts us out very well with a, a conversation. I just wanted to ask Kristen and, and Bruce, as journalists, by a pretty notorious pedophile priest, John Gagan. Um, I did um, reporting in that series looking at the archdiocese's uh, uh, you know, cover-up, really, of, of sexual abuse. It uh, laid the groundwork for massive scrutiny of the archdiocese and um, in that city. And uh, really, um, I think, kind of identified me as a reporter that was willing to look at this topic. Um, because once I did those uh, stories, I would get calls from people asking me to look at institutional response to sexual assault in other uh, arenas. So I looked at the Hasidic Jewish community, I looked at family courts, and then at the center I did a big series looking at how colleges and universities respond to and adjudicate campus rape cases. So that has been my, um, I guess, experience in this topic. Um. Much of what I know about how to report best on on sexual assault issues I learned from Kristen Lombardi. So whatever she says is true. Um, <laughs> if any of you have seen Spotlight, there's a moment where one of the characters says, "Well, but 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 the Phoenix already had this story." Her. Uh, <laughs> um, I. Uh, you know, like a lot of reporters, some of my earliest reporting was on, on criminal justice, and it stayed with me as a theme uh, as my career beginning in the early 80s moved on. And in the mid-90s, I was doing a lot of writing for The Nation magazine on uh, the criminal justice system and on the experiences of survivors of violence and, and whether what was then a very kind of vengeance and punishment driven uh, political agenda was really meeting the needs of uh, survivor populations. And, and in part because of that, um, I began spending a lot of time talking to um, sexual violence survivors and advocates and networks and came to the conclusion that what we as journalists um, at that point knew or thought we knew in the approaches that we often would take to both individual survivors and to these stories um, was at best ignorant and at worst harmful. Um, so in the, in the mid-90s, it wasn't only me working on this, there were a few other journalists and clinicians and advocates and educators all finding ourselves working on this and we came together through support from something called the DART Foundation in 1999, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which today is located at Columbia University. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, sexual violence has been at the heart of what we do, um, trying to, first of all, learn from uh, scientific evidence, clinical evidence, trying to learn from survivors themselves, but also trying to learn from journalists who have got it right what best practices are and to start both an interdisciplinary conversation that includes 
folks like these here at the table, and also within the craft, within the tribe, a journalist-to-journalist -journalist conversation about how to improve reporting on um, survivors of violence of all kinds, but with a, often a very particular focus on uh, violence against women and, and sexual violence, a particular and pervasive problem in our culture. Um, I'll leave it there, and I'm sure we'll come back to specifics as the conversation goes on. Don't leave it there, Bruce. Keep going. Um, I have come to this space in so many ways, and, and, and while I am a journalist and I do write about gender-based violence as well as lighter topics, I think I'm coming to you all today with more of a victim-based perspective for the purposes of why we're here. Um, I was sort of thrust into this spotlight, no pun intended, <laughs> Phoenix, um, <laughs> Uh, through my own case, which was a gang rape in 1984 at the University of Virginia. I know that sounds a little familiar to many of you and is very timely. Um, and as my case was being adjudicated, but much more before that, I decided to go public because I thought, oh, what the heck? What's the harm in this? Why wouldn't anybody embrace the experiences of somebody who's been through something so horrible? And I could not have been more wrong. And... Um, it was so interesting because I was not dealing with the two of you. Um, you know, I, and what we'll talk about a little bit today is some of the most egregious um, examples of lack of best practices that journalists have done in approaching me. And it was, I'm proud to have been a guinea pig and sort of one of the first people to come forward with, I think, the exception of Trisha Miley, the Central Park victim whose, whose focus was mostly on traumatic brain injury. Um, but also some of the most wonderful experiences in the way journalists have boosted this. And here we are today, as Celia mentioned, just at the center of this storm and how are we going to be better. So I decided, um, after my own case was over, to sort of continue to, to leave my then career as a party planner. Gee, could that be more different? Um, hey. And... Um, you know, to, to be a full-time advocate and to write and to speak. And now, rather than just focusing on universities and colleges, which, of course, a systemic failure, I have moved on to a place of speaking with sports teams, both professional and on campuses, speaking with corporations. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Celia Wexler. I'm a member of the Press Club's Professional Development Committee, and I've written two books. The first, Out of the News, Former Journalists Discuss a Profession in Crisis, won a national award from the Society of Professional Journalists. But it was the second book uh, to be published this fall, Catholic Women Confront Their Church, Stories of Anger and Hope, which introduced me to the challenges of interviewing sexual assault survivors and writing their stories. So I was very receptive when Julie Hsu, the head of our journalism institute, and Julie, you should stand up so people can see you. <laughs> suggested this panel and helped plan it. We knew this topic would be newsworthy, but we could not have predicted how newsworthy. Whether it was Rolling Stone's story of a gang rape that failed to withstand scrutiny, the role of a stand-up comic in calling out decades-old accusations against Bill Cosby, the revelation that a former Speaker of the House had been paying hush money to someone he had reportedly abused as a high school coach, or the new feature film, Spotlight, reminding us of the Catholic Church's efforts to cover up priestly pedophilia. Sexually, sexual assault has definitely been in the news. Indeed, 2015 ended with Cosby being criminally charged for a sexual assault he committed allegedly in 2000, he allegedly committed in 2004. And as we know, 2016 began with allegations of abuse at an elite prep school in Rhode Island that occurred in the 1970s and 80s. And even next week, on January 14th, the American Association of University Women will hold an event here at the Press Club to discuss their new analysis of reported rapes on college campuses. But writing about sexual assault allegations and interviewing survivors can present many unique challenges. And we, today, hope to give you some guidance about reporting on rape and sexual assault. And we have a terrific panel. And I'll, I will go right to left. 
hopefully will my right anyway. Um, Kristen Lombardi has been an award-winning journalist for more than two decades, for nearly two decades, I should say. I don't want to make her older than she is. She has worked for the Center for Public Integrity since 2007. Her investigation into campus assaults earned her the Robert F. Kennedy Award, the DART Award, and the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Public Service. As a young staff writer for the Boston Phoenix, her reporting helped expose the clergy sexual abuse scandal in that city, and her investigative reporting has earned her many journalism awards, including a Neiman Fellowship in Journalism from Harvard in 2011. Uh, Bruce Shapiro is executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, which encourages innovative reporting on violence, conflict, and tragedy worldwide. An award-winning reporter on human rights, criminal justice, and politics, he is a contributing editor at The Nation. His books include Shaking the Foundations, 200 Years of Investigative Journalism in America, and Legal Lynching, The Death Penalty and America's Future. His work at DART also earned him an award from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies for his contributions to the social understanding of trauma. In 2011, Liz Sakuro's memoir, Crash Into Me, A Survivor's Search for Justice, was published. She's an advocate for sexual assault survivors and a public speaker, and is a regular contributor to all the major broadcast networks. She writes for the Daily Beast, Glamour, and Time. She teaches Georgetown University journalism students about interviewing the survivors of violence. And she started her own foundation, STARS, Sisters Together Assisting Rape Survivors, supporting nonprofits that help victims of sexual assault, incest, and domestic violence. Her work has been honored by Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and the Victims' Rights Law Center. And our last panelist is Jennifer Marsh, who's the vi Vice President of Victim Services at RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, the country's largest anti-sexual violence organization. Marsh has worked as a subject matter expert in the area of sexual violence for more than 10 years. She currently oversees the National Sexual Assault Hotlines as well as Sexual Assault Helplines for the Department of Defense, Defense and the Peace Corps. And we will make sure with this wonderful panel that you have enough time for your questions. Thank you all for being here today. And I'd like to start by just asking each of you to describe your respective organizations and to tell us how you each got involved with the issue of sexual assault. And we will just start with Kristen and move down, I think. OK. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, as Celia mentioned, I'm now at the Center for Public Integrity. That's a nonprofit journalism organization. Our mission is investigative reporting in the public interest. Um, I have been uh, reporting on um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, and rape uh, throughout the course of, of my career. Um, I pretty much. Uh, learned uh, how to do so on my own through investigative stories exposing systemic failures or wrongdoing involving sexual abuse, rape, or child molestation victims. Um, and my first real experience with this was in 2001 as a, a pretty young reporter um, uh, doing an investigative piece on Boston Archdiocese's cover-up of four decades of uh, child molestation